I'm going to be reading uh, from 1 John 5, 13 to 21, and I really enjoyed John's summary a whole lot more than uh, the entire scripture that I'm about to read to you. I thought he, he went right to that, the last verse that I'll read it is, little children, keep yourselves from idols. I'll come back to that. But wait till you hear everything that comes before that. So stay with me on this one. Hang on, because it's quite a scripture. And I'm glad that John's the one who's going to be sharing more about it after I'm done reading it. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the boldness we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the request made of him. If you see your brother or sister committing what is not a deadly sin, you will ask and God will give life to such a one, to those whose sin is not deadly. There is sin that is deadly. I do not say that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that is not deadly. We know that those who are born of God do not sin, but the one who was born of God protects them, and the evil one does not touch them. We know that we are God's children and that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Have I shared with you the secret of good preaching? Not that I've mastered this, but this is the advice that I've received. There are three components to good preaching. The first is you need a really, really compelling introduction, the thing that I'm butchering right now, the thing that grabs people's attention and makes them want to pay attention to what's going on. You need a really, really good introduction. Secondly, you need a really memorable closing something that people will take with them when they go home and that they can actually integrate into their daily lives. So you need, first, a really good uh, opening. Second, you need a really good closing. But perhaps most importantly, you need to take the first and the second and put them as close together as possible. We are arriving at the closing of the epistle of 1 John. And we call it an epistle, we call it a letter, but it doesn't actually meet most of the standard criteria of a letter. There's no uh, greeting or welcome, there's no concluding benediction. It doesn't read like a letter. In fact, it reads much more like a sermon. Uh, And some scholars have said that's actually the best lens with which to try to make sense of this text, that this is a sermon. Now, most likely, it's not a sermon that was delivered orally and then transcribed and passed around because the author of 1 John is very conscientious of the fact that he is writing. Repeatedly, he refers to the text to the fact that he is writing. I write to you, I write to you, I write to you because. So it's not a sermon that was delivered orally, but it, it, it's structured as, it has sort of the form and structure of a sermon. And you can almost see John making some of these classic preacherly mistakes along the way, like these verses that really are kind of tricky in verses 16 and 17, where John says, if you see your brother or sister committing what is not a mortal sin, uh, you will ask and God will give life to such a one, to those whose sin is not mortal. So it's as if John is laying down this kind of general principle of life. But then, as preachers sometimes do, I've experienced this myself, as you're saying the general principle, the edge case comes to mind. You're like, oh shoot, I have to talk about the edge edge case. Uh, There is a sin that is mortal. I do not say that you should pray about that. But then you don't want the edge case to distract from the general principle, and so you loop back around to the general principle. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that is not mortal. And so John is preaching. And if the important thing in a, a good sermon is sticking the landing, if the important thing in a good sermon is the conclusion, how would we say John did? If you were a professor of homiletics, of preaching, and you had to assign a grade to this, how's the ending sit for you? Little children, keep yourselves from idols. I have to say that at first blush, this is not a good ending. 
It has nothing at all to do with anything that came before it in the text. John has not mentioned idolatry once throughout this entire meditation or sermon that he's writing. The concept of idolatry seems to swing in out of left field. He hasn't talked about it. He hasn't explained it. And he just had such a good ending. We know that those who are born of God do not sin. We know that we are God's children, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. He has this threefold repetition, we know, we know, we know. He ties it back to the opening about eternal life. He has this perfect ending, and he can't quite land the plane. Because at the last second, he's like, oh shoot, i got to remind them about the idols. Little children, keep yourself from idols. At first blush, this is not a great ending. He fumbles it at the one-yard line. Or maybe this is actually a very, very, very good ending, but in a way that we didn't quite expect. Maybe this reference to idols actually gives us another interpretive key that we can kind of read backward from the end toward the beginning of the text and throughout and get a deeper understanding of what John is actually saying. But to do that, we have to understand a little bit more about idolatry, and what idolatry is and how it functions and why it's a big deal within the life of faith. For most of us living 2,000 years after John wrote this sermon, idolatry is not that big of a deal for us. In fact, you could make a really compelling case that the problem today for most people is not that people believe in too many gods, but that we believe in too few because we don't believe in any at all. The default kind of condition is this disenchanted world where there is nothing beyond material experience. What you see is what you get, and that's that. And So idolatry is not really the problem for most of us. But when we engage with the text of the New Testament and the Hebrew Scriptures, we see that idolatry has historically been a big deal within the life of faith. But as I've engaged with the subject of idolatry, or I've sat under teaching about idolatry, it, it, it's never quite clicked for me, to be perfectly transparent with you. I've always struggled with it a little bit. In part because we no longer have these physical objects of uh, stone or bronze or silver or gold. Because we don't have these, the concept of idolatry becomes very, very abstract. It becomes so abstract that it's all at the level of kind of like principles and values and ideals. One pithy way of summarizing idolatry that made its way into a contemporary Christian music song a couple, maybe a decade and a half ago was, Anything you love more than your God is an idol which I think is true, but what on earth does that mean? Because we inhabit this web of loving relationships. We love our spouse, our children, our parents. We're supposed to love our neighbors. We're supposed to even love our enemies. So what on earth does it mean to love something more than God? Don't I love God by loving those around me? And if I love God, doesn't that make me more loving toward those around me? So how does it make sense to be worried about loving something more than God? If God is love, isn't there an infinite amount of love to go around? And as we love God, we love others more. And as we love others more, we also love God more. But not only is it abstract and a little hard to wrap your head around, at times the way that idolatry is talked about makes God seem really, really petty and insecure. As if God is this jealous romantic partner, and this language shows up particularly in the Hebrew scriptures, as if God is this jealous romantic partner that is so concerned anytime he sees his people even looking in another direction. And there is this like healthy mutual desire for exclusivity within a romantic relationship. But if you've ever had the misfortune of uh, dating someone who is extremely jealous, It's not a healthy or life-giving experience. If God is this insecure and petty as to be so jealous, is this God really worthy of our worship? So it's really challenging to wrap our heads around the concept of idolatry in the modern era because it's so abstract, and it also seems like it distorts the image of God to present God in this extremely jealous but also insecure way. But there's another way, I think, that we can try to make sense of idolatry, which is to think about it in terms of formation or who we are becoming. 
that the language of idolatry in the scripture, both New Testament and the Hebrew scriptures, the language of idolatry is inviting us to think about the forces that are shaping us and molding us, making us who we are. Or in the case of idolatry, it's maybe not so much about formation as it is about deformation. It's about being malformed or improperly formed. There's this idea that we came across a couple chapters earlier in the epistle of 1 John where John says that when we see Jesus, we will be like him. It seems like there's this principle at work that John has identified. Perhaps we could summarize it like this. We become what we behold. We become what we behold. The things that we are attentive to have this powerful formative influence. Because the sorts of people that we are is not primarily, we don't make ourselves who we are primarily through a process of conscious, deliberate thought. Sometimes that has a role to play, but by and large, these formative or deformative influences happen at an almost subconscious level, shaping us in ways that we aren't even always aware of. And so if beholding Christ makes us more like Christ than beholding or being attentive to things that are not Christ, maybe also has that same formative or deformative potential. We get remade into the image of that which we behold. So the question of idolatry then is a question of paying attention to where we put our attention. Right? Attention functions almost kind of like breathing. It often happens under the surface, subconscious, doesn't seem subject to conscious control. But there are times where we can think about, what am I being attentive to? And so idolatry is about paying attention to where we pay attention. Because we become what we behold. Where we put our attention, our focus, the things that we look at, gaze upon, focus on, those things shape us at deep subconscious levels. Even folks who aren't Christian recognize this sometimes. The author uh, David Foster Wallace talked about this in a a commencement address that he gave back in the 90s. And this is what he says. Foster Wallace would have identified as an agnostic, but this is what he says. He says, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC or Allah, be it Yahweh or the Wiccan Mother Goddess or the Four Noble Truths or some infrangible set of ethical principles, the reason for choosing a God is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap into real meaning in life, then you will never feel you have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you in the ground. Worship power, you'll feel weak and afraid. And you'll need ever more power over others to keep your fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. The insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful, it's that they're unconscious. They are the default settings. They are the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that's what you're doing. And so even for an agnostic like David Foster Wallace, he recognizes that the things we choose to value have a profound impact on who we are. They shape us. We become what we behold. And so if you focus on power, you will feel you never have enough. If you focus on money and things, it will always be empty. Wherever it is that you put your attention, it's going to have a profound impact on who you are. 
And without naming them quite as such, Foster Wallace actually uses a, a common way of making sense of the concept of idolatry in the modern world. Because we don't have these physical objects anymore that people worship, we talk about them conceptually. And we say three of the biggest idols that we have to deal with in modern society are money, sex, and power. And this is what Foster Wallace points to. And so perhaps the reason the author of John is warning these disciples, these followers of Jesus, these early Christians, to beware of idolatry is because he recognizes the profoundly formative influence of attention. Paying attention to certain things shapes who we are. And I wonder if there's any more we can say about that. Is that kind of the end of the road conceptually? Do we just have to say, well, there's something about us that we become what we behold. That's just the way it is. And we can't really understand the mechanism behind it anymore. What I want to do in the remaining time we have together is try to dig a little bit deeper and see if we can actually understand the mechanism by which attention or beholding has this formative power on us. And I think at root it has to do with desire or what we want. Actually, in the Johannine tradition, the very first words that Jesus of Nazareth ever utters in the Gospel of John is some disciples come up to him, and the very first thing Jesus is recorded to say in the, in the Johannine tradition is, what do you want? It can also be translated as, what are you looking for? What are you seeking after? What do you want? And most of us, when we think about desire, when we think about the things that we want, We think that it originates organically within us. We want something because it started inside of us. My desire comes from inside of me. And then I subject it to a set of rational, logical tests to determine if what I desire is actually truly the best thing I could desire. It all starts with me and my emotions and my intellect. Desire is about me. And if that's the case, I'm not sure idolatry has very much to do with it. Because we want the things we want because we want them. But I think desire is actually far more complicated than just I want what I want because I want it. There's a French philosopher and theologian by the name of René Girard who has done an incredibly deep dive into this idea. And he's come up with a concept that he calls mimetic desire. Mimetic, it comes from a Greek word that has to do with imitation. It's where we get our word mimicry from. And what Girard says is that in human society, in human civilization, in human relationships or human communities, desire is always three parts, not just two. It's not just me and the thing that I want. It's me and the others around me and what they want and me seeing them want something. And so then I begin to want the same thing. Desire always has some sort of imitative, mimetic component to it. We don't just want because we organically want things. We want because that desiring has been modeled for us by someone or something that we see as higher status. And so what we desire is actually about desiring what others desire or desiring the status that they have. Now, I don't have the full, like, billion hours it would take to fully dive into the thinking of Rene Girard on this subject, but I can give you an example. British people desire to eat British food. This is an insane thing to desire because British food is not good. There has never been a person in the history of the universe who lives outside of Britain who has come home and said, you know what I want for dinner tonight? I was thinking Italian, I was thinking Chinese, I was thinking Indian, I was thinking Latin American, but what I really want is British food. It has never, ever, ever happened. British food is not good. Objectively, standardly speaking, it is not good. But British people desire to eat British food because they see other people around them desiring to eat British food until someone tells the British a couple hundred years ago, did you know you don't actually have to eat this food? And then British people colonize and destroy the entire planet just to avoid ever having to eat British food ever again. Because they got a new model. There was a new example. There was a new status that came into town that said, oh wait, I don't have to desire this. I can actually desire this thing. Desire is always mediated by other 
people. We desire what we see others desiring. Now, maybe you say, listen, I'm not British, I'm American, and so my desires are uh, endowed upon me by creator God with freedom. I have full and total liberty. So fine, let's set Girard aside and let's think about economics. The basic principle of economics is supply and demand, and it has to do with price. The more expensive something is, the more people want to produce it, but the less people want to consume it. And so there's this magic point where supply and demand intersect, and that's the price that the market sets all the time for everything, except there are things that actually fundamentally break that market. There's an economist by the name of Torsten Veblen at the turn of the 19th and the 20th century who studied this set of products that did a really weird thing. When price went up, demand is supposed to go down. But for this subset of goods, as price increased, demand also increased. And so these became known as Veblen goods, or what today we call luxury items. And if you don't believe that we desire things because other people desire them, go take a walk around the parking lot this morning before you leave, and just look at all of our Veblen goods that we drove to church this morning in. And we can have all these rationalizations, I bought my car because it gets good gas mileage or it's super reliable or I was really good friends with the dealer. But at the end of the day, we bought our cars because we saw other people desiring cars like that. Desire is always mediated by high status examples in our lives. We want the things that we see others wanting. So idolatry then is about uh, affording a status to a a force or an entity, a being, a power that does not fundamentally deserve that status and beginning to desire the things that the idol teaches us to desire. If you desire money and things, if you afford a certain status to this, you discover this hollowness that creeps into the very soul of your being that can never fully be satisfied. Affording status to others is part of what makes us who we are because we begin to desire the things that they desire. We want because we see others wanting and those wants, those longings, they make us who we are. As Jamie Smith, the Reformed theologian, has so aptly put it in his wonderful book, you are what you love. And what you love is at root about what you desire, what you want, how you understand what the good life is. And so a warning to stay away from idols is a warning about what we desire. In some ways, it's a callback all the way back to the first words Jesus utters in the Gospel of John. It doesn't just call back to the beginning of 1 John. It calls all the way back to the first words of Jesus in John 1, where he looks at these people who want to follow him and asks them sincerely, and I think with all integrity, what do you want? And it's a hard question to answer. Is there so many forces influencing and shaping our desires, making us want things that we ought not to want? Defining for us an image, an ideal of the good life that actually is incredibly hollow and morally bankrupt and results in all kinds of devastation and destruction for ourselves and for those around us. And here's where I think David Foster Wallace may have missed the mark just slightly. His observation is there's a lot of problems in worshiping things like money or sex or power. That it ultimately destroys you. But his antidote is to sort of look at all the great religions of the world and say, well, they're all pretty much the same, just pick one. There's basically no difference between Jesus Christ, that's the JC in his words, Allah, Yahweh, the Wiccan mother goddess, the four noble truths of Buddhism, or even just a set of ethical principles. Just pick something higher, less earthly, just pick something higher and worship that and you'll be protected from all the dangers of worshiping things like money or sex or power. And I'm not interested in denigrating any of these other religions. I think there are things that we as followers of Jesus can learn from people who follow other traditions. But I do want to point out what I see as a fundamental difference in the Christian story that I'm not sure we see replicated anywhere else. And it's actually part of why Rene Girard, after doing this huge deep dive into trying to understand the mechanism of desire and how wanting what others want shapes who we are and also leads to violence in society and then how that violence gets resolved in immoral and unjust ways, Girard does this incredible deep dive and then comes across the Christian story after having been essentially an atheist for much of his life. And what he sees in the Christian story 
is using the mechanisms of mimetic desire, holding forth a high status example and saying you should want the things that this high status example wants, and giving us this highest status example in Jesus of Nazareth, fully God and fully human, the best that anyone could ever be, the one through whom everything in the universe was brought into being, the one who sustains all things, the one who shows us exactly this is what true human life looks like. This is what achievement and status looks like. We should want to be like Jesus. It hold, the Christian story holds Jesus forth as this example, but then gives us this example, crucified, naked, on a Roman cross. And this is a profound inversion of the functioning of mimetic desire. Where if we see Jesus wanting something, and if we actually understand Jesus to have the status that he has so that we want the things that Jesus wants, then our desires are always going to be mediated through the cross. I think maybe this is part of why John goes to the effort of crafting this text that he then sends to these churches. Because he's very concerned with a right and proper understanding of who Jesus is. If we sacrifice Jesus' divinity, then Jesus is no longer the highest status symbol that can exist. The one that we should orient all our, model all our desires after. If Jesus isn't divine, then Jesus is not worth following. But then, uh, sorry, if Jesus, yeah. But then John also warns, if Jesus is not human, then this functioning of the inversion of mimetic desire, it, it breaks down. Because now we still have Jesus, the earthly example, and his life and his death and his teachings and his resurrection. But there's still this higher thing, this divine thing. That we can define however we want, project onto it, whatever we think we should project onto it. In essence, if we strip Jesus of his divinity, then we fall back into idolatry. Because we end up worshiping something that isn't actually Jesus. Because Jesus is this full uniting of God and humanity. So I don't know what was going through John's mind when he was writing these concluding words of this book. Maybe he just had that bleep, little fleeting moment of insight. He's like, oh, shoot, I forgot to say this. i got to write it down. Or maybe, under the power of the Holy Spirit, John is taking in the full sweep of what he knows, beginning with Jesus' earthly ministry and this question to the disciples, what do you want? And John has worked through the implications of saying that this Jesus of Nazareth is fully God and fully human, and he's given his readers all this assurance of what they can know about this Jesus, that we can be born of God and not sin, that we can be God's children, uh, that the Son of God has come and given us understanding, and that he is the true God and eternal life. John has taken in this whole grand sweep of everything and says, one thing you need to do as you move forward from here is to keep yourselves from idols. Would you pray with me? Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks for the example that we have in Jesus. The ultimate high status being come into human form, living and dwelling among human beings, experiencing all of our weakness and frailty while remaining incredibly fully divine. And so we pray, God, in whatever ways we find ourselves tempted toward idolatry, toward the worship, the beholding, the gazing upon things that are not Jesus, that you would do your work of the Spirit, giving us strength and power, so that we would be people who seek to follow Jesus and to keep ourselves from idols. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.